welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd, and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us, just dial 1-800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers will help you with your questions. If that question can wait, or you'd like to send us some pictures, email us at byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live, and do let us know what's going on in your landscape. Don't forget to check out our past shows or features on our YouTube channel. While you're there, hit subscribe so you can watch any of that new material we post. We also have a lot going on on our Facebook fan page, so check us out there after the show. And Jody, you brought a very interesting and extremely timely and lively sample. Well, you know, I like to bring those live samples, so I've brought some <laughs> grubs and a variety. And you can see them, they're nice and, and juicy and moving around. And you can see that really big one right there. That is not one of the typical white grubs that are, are you know, the ones that we worry about. But I wanted to show that when you're sending pictures of grubs or explaining or describing one to me, it's really hard to identify exactly where it is or what it is. So it's good to know where it was found, if it was found in the soil or in wood or other places. And also with some of these, there's actually two different types of the white grubs that we're used to, and it's the mass chafer and the Japanese beetle larvae. And so the Japanese beetle larvae is actually the small one. And how we tell those apart, we put those under the microscope and we have to look at a certain hair pattern on the end of the abdomen, on the underside. So you can, you can see that it's, it's very difficult. We've got to wipe that off. So that's why we don't really know which one it is. But when you look at the adults, so that's the immature. So grubs are larvae of beetles. The adults are here in this box that have been brought in throughout the years. But um, the May and June beetle, these are out at porch lights right now. Um, these actually take three years to develop. We've got the Japanese beetles, which will come out in June. I'm going to predict like the 18th to 20th. Um, <laughs> the mass chafers down here. And then we've also got that green June beetle. And the grub of that one, we always can tell which one it is because it walks on its back. So it's, it's larger and it's kind of strange. And I threw in this juicy guy just uh, for good measure. This one is an Osmoderma beetle. We had a question about that earlier this season. And those are found in decaying wood. So if you've you know, got a tree stump or whatnot, and they turn into this odor of leather beetle down at the bottom. Yeah, very cool, and they're just very odd. So, Matt, your example is yes. not moving. <clears throat> I just have crabgrass. It's not as cool as all the grubs, but um, if you have grubs, maybe it'll control the crabgrass. Uh, so it's that time of year. I mean, the question is always, when do I need to put my pre out? It's been for the last three, four weeks, uh, and if you had it out, great, because now we're starting to see, if you can see in this, uh, slowly, but surely emerging crabgrass on somewhat of a bare soil. This was a pretty thin stand of Kentucky bluegrass. And you'll see these little one to two leaf um, looking things where usually it can be crabgrass, it could also be foxtail. Uh, foxtail germinates a little bit later after uh, crabgrass. Uh, but what you can notice if you wanna tell if it is crabgrass, here's one that's a little bit bigger. And usually they're pretty furry on the top and the bottom. And that would be large crabgrass. And this one is probably in like the three to four, five leaf stage, whereas those smaller ones are in that one to two leaf stage. And from here, every week, they're gonna grow really, really fast. Uh, we have the heat units for it. And if, if you do see them and you didn't get your pre out soon enough, there is a couple post products you can use or Dimension, which is one of the pre products in a lot of uh, carriers with fertilizer. And that one can actually be applied up to tillering of crabgrass. So there's still time to get a pre-emergent out, just have to pick a certain one. And that one contains the thiopyr. So that's the active ingredient that still works on crabgrass after it's emerged. And it is a pre-emergent product. The thiopyr. The thiopyr. All right. Commonly known as dimension, but there are um, other products with that in, in there. All right, thank you, Matt. All right, what do we have this time, Kyle? I have a buckeye with some orange leaf spots that are on there, and um, this time of year, we're seeing a lot of a lot of rust that are showing up. And one of the nice thing about about rusts is they're very, very noticeable. And so on the top side of the leaf, it may just be an orange or kind of brownish spot that you're seeing, kind of like we kind of like we have here. But if we flip it over. Let's see if I can hold my hands still enough. You get these orange pustules that 
that show up. And so it's, and when it's severe enough, you can actually even just rub those off um, on your fingers. But I, you can see them with the naked eye, and that, those are, are rusts. And so most plants that are out there do have, do have a rust. On buckeyes, really they're not a th um, anything to be too concerned about. Um, later in the season, they, they will kind of go away. This rust um, is Puccinia edropaganus, um, and it actually is more of a pest on some of our, um, some of our large prairie grasses as mm -hmm. well. So like many of our rusts, they do have alternate life cycle or alternate hosts where they have to, um, well, they will have their sexual stage on one host, and in this case, their sexual stage is, is on, the, bu um, is on the, buckeye, the buckeye, and then their asexual stage is on the grass. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, you have a beautiful sample. Yeah, um, a pretty perennial geranium that I wanted to share with everyone. And maybe I'll push it to the side here so it's not right in front of me and you can see it better. Um, this is a, a perennial geranium called Boom Chocolata. And um, it, it's a fun name, isn't it? Um, it gets that name because of the foliage. So the foliage is kind of a dark, it has kind of a dark maroon edge around the edge of the leaves. And when you see the plant in the landscape, it has a, a much darker green appearance to it, which is quite pretty. Um, this plant has just started blooming. These are the very first uh, flowers to come on. And if you look really closely, you can see that there's a ton of buds on this plant. So it's gonna be blooming for a while now, probably for another three or four weeks. Um, so it'll be really, really pretty in this, you know, late spring, early summer uh, period in the garden. Um, so it is a perennial, comes back year after year. This is this plant is planted in a location in our landscape which is kind of hot and exposed and not the greatest of soil. And this has been a little bit of an experiment with this plant to see how it's done, and it's actually done very well. Um, it's very, it's it's an upright plant, so it doesn't tend to kind of lay down or flop down on the ground. It, it's standing very upright. And um, even when the flowers are done, the foliage will look nice and pretty throughout the rest of the summer. So um, if you're looking for some new perennials, you know, for the garden this year, this, this would do well in full sun to partial sun. And um, again, it's Boom Chocolata is the name of this perennial geranium. So. <laughs> Which is hard to say without smiling. I know, it's a fun name. <laughs> it is. All right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, Jody, you have a handful of very first questions. First one here is from Howells. And this is, uh, she's a teacher, and last August they found a caterpillar outside, put it in a house, gave it leaves, it did this, and nothing happened. She thought it was dead, and then it started wiggling, and she wonders what it'll turn into. She's very excited about it. Yeah, this looks like a type of sphinx, sphinx moth, and we could probably tell if we knew what it was eating, but when it emerges, probably soon, if you've got it outside or still in the house, then or in the bug house. It mm -hmm. should emerge as a moth and it will go find a mate and hopefully lay eggs on another host plant. Perfect, yeah, I'm very excited about that. All right, so your next two pictures are, um, she, she sent us these, she found this little guy, she called it a grub worm, uh, in a very weedy patch. She knows it doesn't look like white lawn grubs and it's too early for iris borers. So what is it? Yeah, it looks like a type of cutworm, so probably a black cutworm. Um, is just wandering around. Wandering yeah, around in a very weedy patch. So Okay, yeah, they usually it... eat the weeds first. They can be a pest of like bluegrass, I believe, mm -hmm. but usually not in high numbers, then it shouldn't be a problem. Squish. Yeah, I guess so. Feed it to the birds. <laughs> yeah, birds will find it. <laughs> All right. And you have one more picture here, and this one is a moth, and he just is asking this is a Lincoln viewer, wonders what kind of moth. Um, we call that a boring brown moth. So this one, it's like a type of geometrid. Um, we call it that because those are inchworms as caterpillars, but there's probably like 1,400 different species, so I can't say which one, but that's the okay. type. So is its a juvenile stage a pest? Um, it's an adult, so it's not a pest. Right, yeah. and the juvenile stage All the caterpillars are maybe. Maybe, all right, okay, so look for an incher. Yeah. All right. And squash it. Right. Feed to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna have fat birds. <laughs> All right, Matt, you have two pictures on this. Um, this is a Lincoln viewer. Wants to know what this plant is. Does have a squarish stem, and he sent us another picture of it, and uh, he said it grows like wildfire. So I think, uh, yeah, that first one, common chickweed, is a uh, winter annual, and it does cover the ground like that. And then this next one might be corn speedwell or 
I might be not seeing the right one here. I think uh, what they do is they have multiple generations in a year. Uh, if it is uh, common chickweed, so it can spread really fast. Uh, so it has a really shallow root system, so it can be pretty easy just to almost rake out of there or pull out of there. Um, so if you're looking for control, I would say do that besides spraying. All right, yeah, and he didn't really put in that in this first picture, you know, it's a little hard to see height yep. on that. Yep, it's usually not very tall, but it, yeah. that's kind of what it looks like to me. I zoomed in as far as I could. All right, uh, your next two pictures are a grass. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she has sprayed this twice with over the top and a spreader sticker, and it's not showing any signs of giving up the ghost. So that was, I get, it was spread over the top? She said uh, she sprayed the sprayed grass over the, top. Over the okay. top with over the top okay. spray yeah. sticker. I don't know what yeah. kind of spray that was used, but usually if it was like a glyphosate, it would probably work on this grass. It kind of looks like uh, just smooth brome grass, which can be difficult to control. Um, so I would say a glyphosate application and it might take two because they have underground rhizomes and they will uh, be a little bit tougher to kill in the spring All right. when they're growing pretty vigorous, yeah. vigorously. All right, excellent. And knowing that it will kill everything else. Yes, and it should kill everything else. Okay, thank you, Matt. Yep. All right, Kyle, um, this is a viewer who, from Waterloo mm -hmm. and they want to know what all of these are. Are. A viewer with some questionable morals, maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's mushroom puns abound. But, um, so he, we have some morels, um, also some false morels, mm -hmm. and they can look somewhat similar. Right here, this is a picture of, of one of the false morels that we're looking at. But you do want to make sure you know what you're what you're picking. Anytime you're out foraging for a mushroom, you really want to make sure that you know what it is. Um, case in point with the, the false morels, you know, they won't kill you, but you'll have quite the tummy ache if you, if you end up eating them. And so a few ways that you can differentiate false morels from true morels, first is just the overall, the overall pattern of the cap. And so a true morel is going to have kind of a pitted, um, a pitted cap, almost like a kind of in a honeycomb pattern. Whereas the false morel is going to be more of a, more wavy um, as well. And then False morels are, um, are not, 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 not near as symmetrical as you get. They almost look like maybe someone has stepped on one side of them um, compared to the true morel, which is fairly symmetrical. Other thing to do, and if you, can, if you can tolerate cutting one of your morels in half, is to cut it in half and look at it. And I think in the first picture, we actually, he actually had done that. Mm -hmm. And a true morel is going to be hollow on the inside, whereas a false morel is either going to have some cottony fibers or maybe just completely completely solid, yep, and so the ones that he's cut there, those are, he had cut a false morel. Mm -hmm. there. So the cool spongy ones are the real deal. The, yeah, the Let's ones up the on top, top the, 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 the lighter colored ones are the real deal, yep. All right, excellent, thank you, Kyle. And you have one more picture, and this is actually a Wagner, South Dakota viewer, and this dried up fungus is growing on half a barrel container, comes back, Year after year, he's calling it either candle snuff or dead man's fingers, and he wonders, is it toxic to other plants or vegetables that he grows in this container thing, and how does he get rid of it? Yeah, so I, so I actually think that this is a, a, that it is a type of xylaria, um, not the true dead man's fingers. Typically, those are a little bit larger, um, and the, with the, the size of these dead man's fingers would be a, um, a little bit wider at this stage. Um, stay tuned for next week to learn a little bit more about them as well. <laughs> but the, I, I, so I think it is a type of xylaria. Um, xylaria is a it is a common wood rotting fungus. Um, can be pathogenic, but really on pathogenic to primarily woody hosts. And so as long as you're not growing other woody things in the garden, um, probably not, nothing to worry about. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Sarah, uh, your first one here is a Blair viewer, two pictures, and um, these shrubs are yellow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are the shrubs to begin with for our viewers? And second, why are they yellow and are they done for? Yeah, so these are arborvitae and they are dying. Um, <laughs> this is winter desiccation injury, which we've seen a tremendous amount of this year due to the dry winter conditions that we had. 
So given the extent of the dieback in these plants, I don't really think you're going to be able to get them to recover. So I would pull them out and replant and make sure that if you're going to do arborvitae again, that you water them really, really well in the fall from September to October um, and make sure that they're not dry going into the winter. And they probably don't like that full That's sun not a great location rock. either with the rock mulch. And I don't know what side of the house this is on, but um, arborvitae really prefer more of a afternoon shade location. So if you could find a place where they get morning sun and afternoon shade, they would do much, much better. All right. Thanks, Sarah. And you have two more pictures on this one. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, two large evergreens, 30 years old, probably spruce is beautiful. But then this one has a lot of dead branches. Mm -hmm. She's deep watered. She wants to know if it'll fill back in or should she cut it down? Yeah. You know, I can't tell from the pictures exactly why these branches have died, but they are they are dead. If the branches don't have any green foliage on them, they are dead and they will not send out any new needles. So you're, you, you really should probably just go ahead and remove those dead branches. Whether there's going to be enough left of those trees for you to be happy with them, that's, that's pretty much up to you to decide. But it looks like there's going to be a pretty bare section on that, on that one side. And so, I don't know, it, it, again, it's up to the viewer to decide whether they want right. to live with it or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Well, with the warmer weather, everyone will be enjoying those outdoor activities. Just make sure you don't bring home any unwelcome guests. For our free first feature tonight, Jody is going to talk about ticks. If you've been outside this spring, you know that it is very ticky outside. And the month of May is our tickiest month here in Nebraska. So I'm gonna give you some tips on how to enjoy the outdoors without getting a tick bite. Ticks locate their host by questing. What they do is climb up a piece of vegetation from the ground and they stretch out their front legs, which have tiny hooks on it, enabling them to latch on to a host that's brushing by the vegetation. They get carried away and they start moving upwards. So sometimes people think they're coming out of trees, but really they're coming from the ground and moving up. Many people are horrified by the thought of seeing a tick, but I can assure you it is much better to find a tick and remove it than find out later that you've been bit by a tick and didn't know it. Ticks can remain embedded in the skin feeding for up to seven days, if not detected, and they will get quite engorged. An engorged female tick looks sort of like a grape, but also like a chewed up piece of gum from two years ago. These will fall off the host, and if they are mated, they can produce over 5,000 eggs before they die. The most important thing though is to prevent tick bites. And so there are many things that you can do to protect yourself and your family. First of all, you want to treat your pet according to veterinarian's suggestions. This may be all year round treatment depending on where you live and what ticks are prevalent in your area. Ticks that have been feeding on a pet that has been treated will show up dead. Another thing you can do is wear permethrin treated clothing. This can be available commercially or you can buy the spray yourself in treat your clothes. When the clothing is dry, it is safe to wear, but you want to follow the label instructions on how to treat that clothes because it is a pesticide. Ticks that contact this permethrin treated clothes will not be coming home with you. And the most important thing though is to check yourself after coming in from outdoor activities. You can take a shower within hours of coming inside, but you really want to check those warm, dark places and body crevices. Places to check are going to be the groin area, the armpit, scalps, the belly button, all those dark places. Remove any embedded ticks with tweezers. When you come in, those clothes that you wore, you want to put them in the hot clothes dryer for 20 to 30 minutes on high heat before you put it in the hamper because anything that comes in on clothes can easily crawl out and find a host. Lastly, teach your children and your friends about ticks so they can understand how to protect themselves. Remember, we want you to be outside, we want you to enjoy nature, but we don't want you to be tormented by ticks. So follow these tips and have a great summer. 
Of course, with our good weather, it's so much fun to get out there, enjoy the walk. Just do make sure you follow these tips and tricks to keep the ticks off of you. Yuck. All right, Jody, uh, this comes to us from the panhandle. You have two pictures. It's uh, a scale insect, they think, mm -hmm. on pines, is it? And what do we do about it? Yes, this is pine needle scale. And it's just, it's a scale insect. So again, we want to treat when there's crawlers. For pine needle scale, it's going to be May and June when the crawlers are there. There'll be about 20 to 30 little red crawlers. So you wanna look for those. At that time, you can treat with uh, horticultural oil or insecticidal soap, but we want to stay away from broad spectrum insecticides because most of the time, a lot of natural enemies will feed on scale insects. All right, and your next two pictures are of, on from rural, rural Sioux City, Iowa, 25-year-old Colorado spruce. Are these scale insects? Yes, so the, yes, this is pine needle scale. So there's actually two generations of this scale. So there will be two sets of crawlers. So uh, May, June, July, and August will be the second set. So it's recommended to treat with those products that I just talked about um, for those for two to three weeks because it's an extended emergence of crawlers and probably every seven days. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Jody. All right. Matt, your first two pictures here are uh, 60 acres of land in Washington County, tall grass prairie, and then all of a sudden black locusts. And you can sort of see the colony in the background, and there they are up close. Um, he, he used crossbow. It burned them back, but then all of a sudden here come green shoots from the base. He wonders how to get rid of black locust. Yeah, I think the crossbow is a good step in the right direction. That works well on brushy species, but you might not get control 100% of these in one application. Mm -hmm. So if need be, hit it again this year, and it's gonna deplete that root system of that plant and eventually, hopefully, kill it. It might take more than two years even. Uh, another way to do it, if there's not that many of them, which it looks like they are, would be to trim them and then treat them with Tordon or glyphosate at a high higher rate, just dab on the the cut of the tree and that'll take care of them. All right, thank you, Matt. You have one picture on this one and this is an Omaha viewer. She says she has tons of thistle in the mulched areas, uh, covers an area of about 20 by 20 feet. How do we get rid of thistle yes. for good? And this one is a terrible one because I have dealt with it. Uh, Canada thistle or like, it's almost like a creeping thistle because it, mm -hmm. It has a pretty extensive underground root system, and wherever the roots are, it can pop up new plants of thistle. So they usually start out small, and they spread as a circle, and they'll just keep going and going and going, and they'll end up hundreds of feet wide if you don't do anything with them. So uh, treating them now when they're small like this with products that are systemic, uh, broadleaf herbicides, uh, dicamba and 2,4-D work very well. Uh, so hit them and it might not control them completely because there'll be new plants emerging from that root system So it might be another application and same thing with um, Crossbow similar it's triclopyr that one could be used in conjunction with 2,4-D on these as well All right. Thank you, Matt. All right, Kyle. You have three pictures on this first one. Uh, this is aspens planted in 2008 bare leaves and some leaves turning black already. Any thoughts on this? So he sent us two or three pictures here. Yeah, I, I think that there's a few issues going on with this with these trees, none of which are really pathological in nature. And so the, you know, how the, there's really no leaves up top. I think that that is a function of, of the drought that we have had and the tree is, is likely just thirsty. Um, whether or not it will recover, I'm not sure. It would really depend on if those branches are still alive. And then as far as some of the, the leaves that are turning, turning black, really it's too early for any of our, any of our fungal leaf spots. Uh, Marcinina is the big one that we see on, that we see on aspens. But they don't turn the leaves completely black. And so anytime we have the leaves that are completely black like these are, I really tend to think about whether it's something weather related. We did have some pretty cool nights um, recently. And I think that's really what's what's going on with this tree. All right, thank you, Kyle. You have two pictures on the next one. This is a North Platte viewer. Box elders with this growth slash fungus. Um, and we don't know, this is a head scratcher, isn't it? It very much is. I know we were showing the pictures around uh, before before the show. Doesn't look like crown gall. Um, 
There's not really any other galls that we could find any information on on, on box elders. It almost looks like this undifferentiated callus tissue, um, but I don't know. I would love to see a sample, so please submit a sample to the clinic if you can. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, your first two pictures are from a Crescent, Iowa viewer. It's an autumn purple ash. Doesn't have much foliage. <laughs> what do we think at this point? You know, I really would need a lot more information to know exactly what's going on. It looks like something um, systemic, and by that I mean it looks like it's something that's affecting the whole plant. So there, there could have been root issues here, or there could be, you know, it could be some kind of bore. It doesn't necessarily have to be emerald ash bore. There are other bores that will attack ash, especially if a tree is stressed and is declining, and then the bores often come in and finish it off. So uh, there could be a lot of different things going wrong. But it, if, if if this is all the tree is doing this year is this small amount of leaves, it looks like it's probably on the way out for you, and it'll probably, probably be time to take it down and plant with something that's resistant to emerald ash borer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, two pictures on this next one. This is a Pilger viewer that has an Armstrong maple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only a year old. The top has not leafed out. Is it time to take the top out? Yeah, it, it looks like that top has died. And so, you know, but the lower part of the tree is still looking pretty good. So what I would do at this point is, is cut that central leader back to the point where you have a good living shoot um, to try to reestablish a new central leader and then give it some really good care this summer. You know, make sure that it stays well watered when conditions are dry. Um, water it in the fall. Don't fertilize it. We don't really want to push it with fertilizer too much and see if it can rejuvenate a little bit of vigor and recover and come out strong next year. All right, and your final picture here is a maple in Donovan. Box, a box tree. So they want to know whether they can take the, the box off and remove that soil and not harm the tree. It, it, I think it would definitely be a good idea to take that box off and, and take the soil down to the original soil grade. Now you may very well find that there are some roots in that soil. And so you will be doing some damage uh, to those roots as you remove that old soil. But I think in the long run, It'll be better for the tree to have that soil away from the trunk. Um, and hopefully the tree will recover from this and will go on and live a long time for you. So I would definitely take it off. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, our garden is now almost all planted. We even got a little rain this week to help everything get off to a great start. Here's Terry to guess, get us up to date on what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, as you can see, we've had volunteers here and they have been doing a lot of planting. All of our containers are almost full and most of the plants are in the ground. Still working on the distribution garden wall, so we won't be able to get that one planted quite yet, but the little bit of rain that we've had here in Lincoln has really slowed that progress down. But we are looking forward to getting those plants in that is where we grow a lot of our veggies for donation to the local food bank here in the East Campus area. We have a lot of new All America Selection plants this year. So we're looking forward to showing you what they look like once they get bigger after we planted them here in the garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, it is time for lightning. All right, Sarah, you are First up, this is uh, from many viewers who want to know whether the tips of boxwood that are all brown will recover if you prune them off. They will regrow new tissue. They won't recover, so prune them off. All right, this is a La Vista viewer who has a Japanese maple that has been in the ground a while, but one whole side has no leaves. Should he wait or should he assume that is dead? Um, you can wait if you really want to be conservative, but I'm probably 98% sure it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a central Nebraska viewer who is wondering whether the predicted cold temperatures for this weekend are going to damage tomatoes and peppers. Definitely. They don't like anything below about 40 degrees, so provide protection. All right. Uh, this is a viewer in Lincoln who wants to know whether they can dig and move their asters now. Have too many and they're too big. Yeah, since they're a fall blooming perennial, you could move them now and then just take good care of them over the summer with watering and, and they should reestablish and recover. 
All right. Is it uh, okay to plant another planting of spinach and lettuce right now? This is a Syracuse viewer. Yeah, still time for that. Plenty of time for that. All right. Nice job, Sarah. Okay, Kyle, ready? Uh, does it matter? Because <laughs> your questions are always hard. Is uh -huh. that what I'm it's hearing? The... <laughs> Whining. <It's... laughs> All right. Your first one is actually from a viewer. It's interesting. He wants to know whether he should clean the corn shucks out of his iris bed to prevent root rot in his iris or leave them there to keep the soil moist. I would probably leave them there. Um, they're not, there's no diseases that would move between the corn husks and the, and the irises. All right. Uh, this is a viewer in Omaha who has, uh, or in Lincoln, who has necrotic lawn disease and dollar spot has treated it every two weeks from May to September, but it didn't work. Is that the wrong treatment? It's, yeah, certainly the wrong treatment. You may even have it, you may have misidentified the disease as well. So. All right, this is a David City viewer who wants to know how early rose rosette would show up in shrub roses. Um, could show up now, but typically it's gonna be a little bit later in the season, um, late, uh, late June. All right. A Henderson viewer has catalpas that leaf out well, but then they turn black and curl every summer. Is there a prevention for that? Not that I'm aware of, just something to deal with. All right. And a person who does have buckeyes said theirs is so rusty in the fall that it's orange. Will this kill the tree? I would wonder if it's actually rust and if it's not um, one of the other leaf spots, but typically the rust on buckeyes does not, will not kill the tree, no. Nice job, see? You did fine. You tied. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> All right, Matt, are you ready? Yes. This is a Seward viewer who put her pre down on April 27th and she wonders if she needs another and if so, when? Uh, if you put it down then, I would say June 15th if you're going to do a second application. All right. A Schuyler viewer has lime green grass and wonders whether ironite would work on it. Uh, typically this time of year when you have a lot of rain, bluegrass will just get that yellowish color, but generally goes away. Iron would help. All right. Uh, this is a Bellevue viewer who wants to know whether Fiesta is available locally. It's a recommendation we made. Uh, it might be, but you can order it online as well. All right. Uh, this viewer didn't say where they're from, but they want to know whether 2,4-D will volatilize after it dries on a plant. Yes, it can. Uh, temperature inversion. All right. Um, a homeowner wonders if there is any way to slow down the growth of turf. Uh, plant growth regulators. All right. They do work, but you have to spray them on. Okay. This is a viewer who ap applied gypsum monthly to turf to improve the drainage. Does that work? Uh, it can actually help the soil out depending on what your pH of the soil is, but typically not for drainage. Okay, excellent. Nice job. Okay, Jody, ready? Mm -hmm. This is a Lincoln viewer who wonders whether sow bugs will hurt the plants in her containers. No. All right, we have an Ogallala viewer who has a very large hackberry with brooms all over, and they're wondering whether the brooms will spread to their other hackberries. I don't think so. I think it's specific to that plant. All right, um, would the grubs in the soil by a rose right now be Japanese beetle grubs or June bugs? It could be Japanese beetle grubs or probably mass chafer grubs. All right, uh, this is a viewer who had columbine that was basically annihilated by sawflies. They, they used seven on them, but they're wondering what now, or was that a good choice? Uh, well, the plant will be fine. They just eat all, all the leaves mm -hmm. and leave the veins all right. and the stems. It'll come back next year. All right, um, McCook viewer has grubs in the raised beds and they wonder if they can still use grub control where they're gonna plant tomatoes. No, they should not. All right. Nice job. Good grief. Look at that. We went through a lot of questions. Who won? Man, Matt I wins. Guess. Give him the trophy. I tried really hard on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy to be close to it. <laughs> Someday. All right. Sarah, what are our plants of the week this time? Well, we have another little perennial geranium here to look at. This is Big Root Cranes Bell, another member of the geranium family. And um, it does have some pretty big fleshy roots uh, that it grows from. Um, 
It is a semi evergreen, so you'll have some green foliage on there um, all throughout the winter. And uh, it's kind of spreading, so it will spread through the garden uh, in comparison to the one I showed you earlier, which was more of an upright clump type of uh, perennial geranium. So um, a beautiful little geranium if you want something maybe as a ground cover for the garden. Full sun to part shade would be a great location for that. Then we have a couple of giant alliums. So we have a white uh, flowering giant allium and then a purple giant allium. And um, these are ornamental plants in the onion family. And they have um, these obviously great, great big large circular heads um, that are very showy when they, they um, are blooming. Um, the alliums can be a variety of heights, but the giant alliums tend to be in around the, um, I'm gonna say two to three foot height range. Um, and they have kind of a low pair of leaves that um, appear at the base of the plant. And the leaves will go dormant after the plant has bloomed and then it'll kind of be gone until it appears next year and, and blooms again in your spring garden. So um, think about maybe adding some ornamental alliums to your landscape. And they smell like onions. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> and they attract those bumblies. I love it. Thank you, Sarah. All right, um, Jody, your first question here is from an Omaha viewer and wonders what is on this asparagus. And I think you can see those yeah, little bitty things. Yeah, there's a lot of asparagus fetal eggs on that. So you can just pretty much take those off with your hand, just squish them. All right, and then you have uh, two pictures on this next one. This is Carney, insect damage to um, asparagus. She tries to squish the beetles. She wonders if the damage is from something else and is there something she can treat with after the harvest stops. Okay, that also looks like a asparagus beetle because they'll have distorted um, spears. So when the plant goes to fern, if you have more than like 20% of your plants with larvae on there, you can treat with an insecticide that's labeled. Um, you can also cut back your ferns too. All right, thank you, Jody. You have one more picture, and this is um, actually a viewer last year. She had ants kind of in a long trail, and this year, She's got this great big pile there at the corner. She's tried a home defense thing, but they come back. So what? Okay, so yeah, those are, those are pavement ants. That's characteristic. They always get, make their gallery under the slab and they kind of take out the debris. Um, what was it? They always come back. Yeah, so yeah. what happens when you get rid of an ant colony is that it's other ants move in. So what I would do here is if you've got ants trailing, then put some ant bait, sugar ant bait, because pavement, like, pavement ants like a sugar, put that on the outside by the patio. So there are some stakes that you can put on the outside. And then you can remove the trim um, and then maybe seal up that gap there by the expansion joint so they aren't coming inside anymore. All right, thank you, Jody. All right, Matt, uh, your first one here is a Lincoln viewer. One picture, fescue lawn, he's got these brown patches getting bigger and bigger. He's identified nimble will in his yard and the neighbors, and he's wondering if he should kill the whole yard and start over. Uh, at that point, I would probably start over because there's not much good usable turf in there. If you have nimble will, uh, application of glyphosate now, and then probably again in a couple weeks, two, three weeks, just in case some of those rhizomes um, grow again. Uh, and then, I don't know if you want to wait until fall, that would probably be best. But if you can kill this stuff off, uh, the sooner the better. All right, thank you, Matt. And then you have two pictures here. And this is actually from Lake of the Ozarks. It's a zoysia lawn, went dead last year, and now he's seeing holes in it. And he's wondering if it's grubs that pupated into adult beetles or do they have the world's largest ants? And you get it because it's turf. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so if, if the zoysia did die last year, which is somewhat odd because zoysia is pretty hard to kill, uh, there could have been grubs in there that pretty much took care of the whole root system. And then what you're seeing this year is bird peckings. Mm -hmm. So those holes are made from birds looking for whatever's under there, either grubs or some type of bug, I'd, I'd say. All right, thank you, Matt. All right, Kyle, uh, this is a Hastings viewer that has cucumber plants. A couple are getting these yellow spots on the leaves and they're wondering what they can do about it. Uh, not a whole lot. It's most likely bacterial leaf spot. There are some other um, diseases that show up on cucumbers, but typically bacterial leaf spot is the first one that shows up. Um, a copper application would maybe do something, but big thing is just to, um, to avoid overwatering. 
All right. Uh, your second picture here is a viewer from rural Tecumseh. She has spots on her tomato that she thinks are rust. They are not. Um, and so I actually, I th primarily it's on the lower leaves. I think it's a nutritional issue um, combined in if it's on the lower leaves, really not. They're, gonna, they're not going to be doing a whole lot anyway, so you can just prune them up, prune those off. All right, and then you have uh, two more pictures here. This is a, a Millard viewer, and early girl bush tomatoes, and then this plant looks sickly. She doesn't want a disease to spread to other plants. So what do you see here? Uh, not a whole lot, unfortunately. The um, pictures aren't aren't the greatest to, to see a whole lot of what's going on. I do think that they had mentioned that it was a fairly recent transplant mm -hmm. as well. So I would wonder if it's not just dealing with some transplant shock, maybe it a little bit. Um, I'm not seeing anything on there though that would indicate a disease that would spread to the other tomatoes. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, your first two pictures are a Waverly viewer that has a burning bush and he's wondering, um, what to do, trim them down to new leaves or halfway? They're about 25 years old. Well, I wouldn't trim them back halfway because you have a lot of dead stems in there and, and you'd be leaving behind a lot of dead tissue. So I would cut them back to the point where you actually see the branches are still alive. That may leave the hedge looking quite ragged. So you may, it may be better to um, prune them down farther. Uh, d well, it kind of depends on which shrubs are worst and how far down you have to prune those. Once you do the, the worst ones, then maybe you can do a little kind of um, clean up pruning after that to kind of even things out a little bit on some of them that had a little bit more that was left alive. Um, but you're, you need to remove the dead tissue because it's not going to regrow. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, speaking of dead or not, you have two more pictures and this is a 45 year old privet hedge. They keep it five to six feet tall. They remove the leaves at the base. They, they're getting some openings where maybe some of the original plants have died. They want to know whether to trim the whole thing back to a foot or so to get it to fill in from the base and or start over with new plants where those gaps are. Yeah, I, I really hate to see it when people trim hedges down to a set height and they just make, you know, just a, with a hedge pruner, just come in and make a straight cut. I know it's a whole lot more work, but it's really better on plants like this to take out some of the heaviest woody stems all the way down to the ground because that helps the plant and encourages it to send up new young shoots from the base. And I think if you did that, um, it might help this, this hedge over the time and these bare spots may, may fill back in a little bit. Um, but I realize it's, what I'm recommending is a lot of work. It's a lot more work than coming in with a hedge pruner and just cutting it back. Um, your other option would be to go in and just plant some new plants in those open spots and let them try to fill in the gaps. All right, thank you, Sarah. And you have two more pictures here. This is a Wood River viewer that has a cottonwood, <clears throat> excuse me, seedless, growing fine except for one dead branch that's kind of concave at the base. Should they go ahead and cut that out? So you can see it much better in this picture that there's a large section of dead bark on that side of the tree. And those two little I'm going to call them wings on the side is where you're getting new growth from the living bark of the trunk that is trying to start, start to seal up that dead bark section. Um, go ahead and prune out the dead branch because it's, it's dead and there's no benefit to leaving it there. Um, but realize you have a big de section of dead bark there and so you're going to need to take good care of this tree um, so that hopefully it can continue to develop that callus tissue and seal over that damaged area and, and go on and be a healthy tree for you. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, we have been getting a lot of questions about different types of grassy weeds. They can be very difficult to identify even with a really good picture. So here's Rock to help us figure out how to identify certain weeds. We are frequently asked to identify plants by digital images that are sent into Backyard Farmer. We want to help you help us by giving you some pointers on one of the most difficult group of plants to identify, the grasses. If you take a wide shot of a grass in within a grass, often we have trouble telling which is which. So what we're going to show you is show you some structures on a grass plant that should be in the pictures you send us, and then we can do a better job being able to give you one, what the grass is, and two, if you're asking for a recommendation for control, offering some viable options for control. 
So let's take a look at these structures and explain them in a little bit of detail. Let's start with the leaf blade. The leaf blade comes out of the bud either folded, where it has a distinct midrib, a distinct midline right down the center, or rolled, where it has no distinct midrib. Well, that's one of the first identifying characteristics for grasses, is it rolled or if it's folded. So we need a picture, a close-up of the leaf, or several leaves, if we can see how that is, whether it's folded or rolled. That's the first step. The second step is what are the structures around where the blade meets the stem? We have the ligule the, and the oracle, and they are also key identifiers in telling you how a grass plants li look. For example, ligules can be prominent or they can be absent. Um, oracles can be clasping or absent. These are very distinct characteristics and are critical to being able to identify the grasses properly and give you the information you need. So take a picture up close where the leaf blade meets the sheath and those structures in there. You don't have to identify which one is the ligural, which one is the oracle. You simply have to take a picture close enough that we can see. So you take a picture from the front and then you pull the leaf blade back and take a picture where that leaf blade joins the leaf. That should give you the information you need at least in the top growth, for us to identify the grass. And then finally, you might want to dig down and look at the roots. If you can see visible white rhizomes, um, maybe we need to send that as well. That's another step in the direction of being able to properly identify the species that you're interested in. So there's the quick step down the list, right? The leaf, is it rolled or folded? The leaf blade, how does it attach to the, to the stem? And is it is there ligules and oracles or are they absent? And then finally, take, just take a spade, pull back the root system, take a quick close-up of that. So a single image is often not enough for properly identification. We probably need several. Of course, we'll still take your good pictures and try to help you with your weed problem, but those tips can help you get a head start on eliminating those weeds from your landscape. You should check out our YouTube channel for video features on weeds and many other topics we've produced over the years. We do want you to succeed in your landscape. There are several videos from past seasons that will help you out. So take a few minutes after the show, check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. All right, Jody, you have two pictures on this first one. This is south of Fremont. She was cleaning out her flower bed and found these bugs eating some volunteer flowers. What are they and will they eat everything else? These are a green dock leaf beetles and they only eat curly dock and green sorrel. So weeds. We, I guess those are weeds. <laughs> Perfect. If those are weeds, your perennials are good. All right. And your next picture is, hello BYF, any idea what this insect is, good guy or back, bad guy? Um, I'm going to say that it's a swamp milkweed leaf beetle. So it's like, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> in the it eye of the milkweed, beholder. But it doesn't ruin, like, it, there's still enough for monarchs. Totally fine. All right, perfect. All right, uh, Matt, your first one here is a North Platte viewer. They live on a city street with a yard to the north. One corner of the yard has this thick foliage in it, and I think we have a second picture here. They wonder whether this thick leafed turf like grass can be controlled in any way. Uh, I I'd, I'd looked at the second picture. It's a s little bit closer. Still tough to tell without having the plant in hand, but I think it is quack grass. Um, like Rock was saying, you have to look at the way that that leaf blade goes to the stem of the plant, and they have clasping oracles, so it's almost like it's hugging it with like two arms around it, uh, and that's how you can tell if it is quack grass, but uh, just by the pictures, that's what I'm guessing it is. And can it be controlled? It can be controlled only one way, and that's with glyphosate. There's no non-selective control. So what you can do is fertilize to encourage the fescue that you have in the lawn to basically outcompete it. And that's probably the best method without having to kill everything off and replanting. All right, thank you, Matt. And you have two more pictures, and this is basically, please help me identify <clears throat> on this particular um, <clears throat> whatever's going on here. Yeah, same with this one. Yeah. It's it's tough to tell what exactly it is without a little bit. I mean, they're good pictures, but there's a bunch of different grasses it could be. By the way, the grass is like kind of churning. It could be downy brome. And if it's growing a lot faster than everything else, uh, that's a telltale sign that it is downy brome. And it's an annual, uh, but it'll continue to grow for the next month and it'll grow three times as fast as a lawn. And you control it how? 
uh, by mowing it. I mean, there's really no non-selective way of taking it out once it's that big. Uh, you can try, but it, it just sets it back a little bit. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, Kyle, your first one here is a columnar Norway spruce with tip dieback. And it was planted in the fall of 2021, and he's seen a number of these uh, tips in the in the tree. He didn't send us a, another picture of it, but what is this in spruce in general, and what do you do about it? Oh, could be there. There are there are some cankers, and so Phomopsis canker is one that <clears throat> can do similar things to this. But the fact that there's no other needles on there, there's no discolored needles or anything like that. I tend to think that it's more more environmental. Especially if he's seen those those that tip die back kind of across um, spread across the spruce tree. All right, uh, you have two pictures in this one. Um, this is dead spots in arborvita, and um, this is in the northwest corner of their yard. Last year they were full and healthy. They treat against insects and they fertilize them. And they did have an arborist say they wondered if a raccoon had climbed the tree. But do you think this is raccoon climbing tree or is this a canker in the harbor vita? <laughs> the, it could be, could be a raccoon um, climbing trees. I've never, I've never watched a raccoon mm -hmm. climb up an arbor vitae to see how, how dangerous <laughs> they are and how much they throw things. But um, also could be cankers as well. The other thing is arbor vitaes, they don't always do the greatest in Nebraska. Um, and if we've had any, any waterlogged soils or you know, if they don't get enough light, we tend to see that, tend to see those large patches of, of death occur. Um, so look, look a little bit more closely, see if there is any sunken bark or anything like that for a canker, but not a whole lot of control for those. All right, and those look pretty old as yes. well. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, you have one picture here from a Grand Island viewer, and this is from the top of their smoke tree. They, uh, and they just took this picture last week. Any idea would have, would have caused the ends of these branches to curl like this? It's probably about 12 years old. So this is a condition called uh, fasciation, and we see it in a lot of different plants. It can have a lot of different causes, too. It can be environmental, can be viral, can be insects, can be genetic, and, and we don't really know why a certain plant will start to do this. So it's just an oddity of nature. Um, I would just prune them out, or if you don't want to, just leave it alone. And I think the, um, the, the buds on the lower parts of those stems will put out some new growth and kind of hide it. So it's just, it's just an oddity, really. All right, and you have a second picture, and this is actually from a Phoenix, Arizona viewer, and uh, wonders why several of his roses have bloomed with as many as 20 roses on a single stem. And we think this could be the same thing, although we can't see the, the flattened section of the stem like we could in the picture for the smoke bush. But um, oftentimes when you get this abnormal growth, you get a, 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 a multitude of buds that develop on, on a section of tissue, and it, that could have resulted in all of these flowers developing on the, the shoots of these branches. So. You know, you can print it out, um, and that's probably that. There really is no chemical control for anything like this, so just print it out and enjoy those twelve roses in a bunch without right. having to pay for them. <laughs> well, we have announcements, of course, of great things in the gardening world, and the very first one is us. We will be backyard farmer live on June seventh, about five o'clock at Northeast Community College in Norfolk. Please join us for that birthday celebration. Our second one tonight is a Benson Garden Walk, which is Saturday, June 11th from 10 to 4. Go on to www.eventbrite.com for tickets. And the third one is the Omaha Rose Society's annual rose show on June 12th at Lauritsen Gardens, open to the public with paid admission to the gardens. So lots of opportunities in the, uh, in the coming weekend or so for and week to be able to have fun things in the gardening world.